yeah, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 16 tonight. Uh, and the title on the programme was The Anointing of David. But we're not going to look at that particularly, even though that is the title. We're just going to, as it says on the slide, we're just going to take ten kind of points to consider on the chapter. Some of which we might not normally consider, because we normally tend to focus on the kind of flow of the action rather than consider other things. So some of the points we're going to look at uh, we might not have considered before. So we've got ten thoughts, so you can track our progress as we go along. Um, So we'll start with verse 1. So at the end of chapter 15, Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So, over the kind of the chapter divide, there's probably a fairly lengthy period that Samuel was mourning for Saul. Hence the question, how long wilt thou mourn? Um, and... We've kind of seen this a lot throughout our look at uh, 1 Samuel so far. But we've seen that Saul is a mixed character. And again, this morning kind of shows us that. Because in the previous chapter, uh, Saul wasn't particularly nice to Samuel. He kind of grabbed him and tried to pull him to him and all that kind of thing. Um, in, In a rage. And we've seen that throughout, that Saul had these kind of dark moods. But yet, people still seem to kind of like him and have some affection for him. So he did have some positive sides to his character. So in chapter 15, uh, verse 11, um, or verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So he cried all night, which is kind of a fairly major mourning for the situation and it implies partly a natural affection for Saul but partly a mourning for the nation that has such a bad leader and which led the nation into problems Um, so Samuel who was a great man mourned for Saul at this stage and we know of course at the end of second first Samuel um, we have the kind of song of David when Saul died and again, David seemed to have kind of a natural affection for Saul. So we can see from this, as I said, that Saul was a mixed character. He had a very dark side, which we tend to focus on. But he also had the more likeable side that we don't see in the record as much, but was obviously there. So Samuel, he mourned for a while about the state that Saul was in. But then, to cheer him up, God sent Samuel on this kind of positive mission to anoint David. Um, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided me king among his sons. So Samuel was told to mourn, was allowed to mourn, but not for too long. So from that we can learn that when we're kind of sad about things, it's okay to be sad about things, but not to kind of make ourselves intentionally sad for too long. So, try and move on when we can. Um, So, another little point is that um, in verse 2, Samuel says, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And there's a few little clues in this chapter which would... You can't prove it, but it seems to suggest that there'd been some kind of a fairly dodgy goings on in Bethlehem, uh, possibly a kind of unsolved murder. So, because the heifer was used for a number of kind of things in the law of Moses, but in Deuteronomy 21, uh, this is one thing it was used for. Um, so, Deuteronomy 21, and the first nine verses gives the detail. Um, if one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it lying in the field and it be not known who hath slain him 
Then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And then various instructions. And then verse 3. The elders of that city shall be taken half it, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not yet drawn in the oak. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer into a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. So, one use of the heifer uh, was when there was kind of an unsolved murder case, uh, and that was Deuteronomy 21. And then there's a few other little clues that suggest something might have been of that nature, might have been going on in Bethlehem. So in verse 4, uh, Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? Now Samuel probably was a fairly kind of big, big figure, like a big personality. So they might have just been kind of wary that he was there because he was such a big character. But alternatively, with this theory, they were trembling because he might have heard about these strange goings on and come to investigate, and that's why they trembled before him. And then, final, another little detail is that Bethlehem was not in Samuel's kind of regular circuit he went on, which again would probably make them tremble because they wouldn't expect him normally to come and see them. Uh, And so if something had been going on, then that would lead them to be really scared. And of course, um, another thing about Bethlehem is we kind of tend to associate it with uh, Christ and his birth. But in the period of the Judges, which wasn't too long before the chapter we're looking at, um, we won't look into them because it's not particularly nice stories, but um, chapter 17 and chapter 19 of Judges, um, you have either kind of evil things happening in Bethlehem or evil people from Bethlehem. So certainly around that time it wasn't a particularly nice place so there may have been this uh, unexpiated death in Bethlehem which would lead the people to be quite scared when Samuel came but then also it made a nice contrast when then something positive happened so our third little point is we're going to look at Eliab um, so verse 4 they said comest thou peaceably and Samuel said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So Eliab was the oldest son and he looked the part. So Samuel thought that Eliab was going to be the one. Uh, but the Lord in verse 7 says no but I thought we'd just look at some of these other sons because we don't tend to think about them too much so the first one was Eliab uh, and, his main, and his name is Ael is my father um, and in 1 Chronicles 27 18 uh, might as well turn that one up Uh, he is probably in 1 Chronicles 27, 18. Um, so in this little section of 1 Chronicles 27, um, it's just saying who was appointed as kind of chief over each of the different tribes. So furthermore, over the tribes of Israel... The ruler of the Reubenites was Eleazar, the son of Zikri, of the Simeonites, Shephatiah, the son of Maker. Uh, and then we skip down to verse 18. Uh, we have of Judah, there was Elihu, one of the brethren of David. Um, and of the brethren of David, uh, Eliab seems the most likely candidate because the name's similar. Um, so he was appointed chief officer of the tribe of Judah. And therefore, is probably a reliable character. Um, but it seems that he probably kind of grew into a reliable character over time, because the other little mention we have of him is in 1 Samuel 17, uh, which is the incident where David's come to the camp uh, when they're facing Goliath. Um, 
And David says, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Um, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answer, uh, saying, So shall it be done, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. But then Eliab um, was angry against David and said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and, thy, and, thy, and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. So in this situation, it was probably quite a tense situation, so you can't be too hard on Eliab, but um, he certainly isn't very nice in, in, in this incident, and he kind of projects his own pride back onto David. Um, and you wouldn't think at this stage that he was going to be a great leader of Judah, but then later on he is. So from the little bit we know of Eliab, we can see that he probably grew as a character. And in this, we can see Jesus and James, because uh, James, it uh, doesn't seem that he particularly followed Jesus and um, kind of was probably jealous of Jesus' character like Eliab was of David. But later on, he grew into a great leader in Judah, exactly like Eliab did. And then a final, final little detail about Eliab uh, is that one of his descendants was Rehoboam's second wife. So there's just a few little facts about Eliab and what he might have been like as a character. Um, yeah, so um, back in chapter 16. Um, so Eliab has passed before Samuel, and Samuel said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Um, and this was a message that David, uh, most of the time, took on board throughout his life. Because all these goings on would have been, obviously because David was anointed king, these moments would have been a massive part of his life. He would have remembered all these goings on that were happening. Obviously he wasn't there for this, but he would have heard what was going on. Um, and David taught Solomon, his son, uh, this very thing in 1 Chronicles 28. Um, so David's assembled all the princes of Israel and the princes of the tribes and all the mighty men of the land um, and he says and thou Solomon, uh, thou Solomon my son know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts if thou seek him he will be found of thee but if thou forsake him he will cast thee off forever so David knew from this incident and from many other incidents in his life that God is not too interested on outward appearances. Um, he searcheth the hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. And that was one of the things he taught Solomon at kind of a crucial time in Solomon's development. Um, so David knew this and he taught Solomon this. Um, but sometimes it can be quite scary that God knows all the thoughts of your hearts because sometimes they're not very good and that could motivate us to do better. But for David, uh, sometimes, uh, it gave him confidence. So the next chapter in 1, in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 17, uh, he says, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. So here's David saying, God, I know that you look into man's hearts, uh, tries the heart and has, and has to pleasure in uprightness but he's willing to put himself forward as an example of that which 
takes a lot of confidence and it's probably not something I'd do but um, if we do live a good life then we need not be overly scared that our thoughts can be seen if we try our best then we can be confident in that and we can see that as a good thing that can bring us and God closer together um, so back in 1 Samuel 16 again um, not put the verses up but um, the kind of selection process of David is a long process because it starts off um, I forget where it is but it's quite a vague description of this character that would be the next king and then it gradually becomes clearer and clearer to everyone that David would be the one uh, but of course God already knew that David would be the one so he was using this long drawn out process to show people lessons at various stages of the way and one reason was to emphasise this point that God looks uh, not on the outward appearance but on the heart so that's one reason why this long drawn out process happened so carry on reading so Eliab wasn't the man then verse 8 Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and he said neither hath the Lord chosen this then verse 9 Jesse made Shammah to pass by and he said neither hath the Lord chosen this so Shammah is an, another brother that has a little bit of information on so we'll just have a quick look at him um, his name wasn't a particularly pleasant one uh, means astonishment or desolation and is used in uh, the more kind of sombre chapters such as Deuteronomy 28 um, and what we know about Shema is what his children were like so if we go to 2 Samuel chapter 13 uh, you read about the first of them Um, so this is an unpleasant incident Um, uh, this is this chapter of Tamar Uh, verse 3 but Amnon had a friend his name was Jonadab the son of Shimea David's brother and Jonadab was a very subtle man Uh, and he said unto him why art thou being the king's son lean from day to day Wilt wilt thou not tell me and Amnon said unto him I love Tamar my brother Absalom's sister um, so we probably know the story um, that Amnon wanted Tamar and he wasn't getting her and Jonadab is the one who is uh, subtle which of course is the word that takes us back to the serpent in the Garden of Eden um, and he's the one who makes the kind of a subtle plan to make it happen so it doesn't seem that Jonadab is a very nice character at all and he was one of the sons of Shema, or uh, whatever name he was given there. Um, yeah, or Shimea, Shema, it's the same person. Uh, but a second son of Shema is in 1 Chronicles 20 and verse 7. Um, and this son is called Jonathan. Um, So verse 6 of 1 Chronicles 20. And yet again, there was war at Gath, where was a man of great stature, his fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was the son of the giant. But when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, slew him. Um, And that's all we hear about him. So... We at least know that he was a mighty warrior who is, pre- who is presented positively, even if we don't know much else about him. But uh, we can see then that Shema, there's two sons recorded of him. One is presented as kind of a sneaky, not very nice character. Um, but the other one is presented as a hero. Um, so... It's hard to say what he was like as a father, but it just shows that in one family you can have two, com- two completely different kinds of people. Um, so, if we go back to 1 Samuel 16 again. Uh, 
Um, so Shema was not chosen. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. So if we go to go flip back to Chronicles again, to 1 Chronicles and chapter 2, we learn that there was another son. Um, no, we don't. We learn that there was a son that died, so there was less sons. Um, so 1 Chronicles 2, um, verse 13, is going through the kind of family tree. And Jesse begat his firstborn Eliab, and Abinadab the second, and Shema the third, Nathaniel the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozem the sixth, uh, and David the seventh. Uh, a lot of the names are a bit different, but it's the same group of sons, probably. Um, so you have here seven sons, but in 1 Samuel 16 you have eight sons. So it would appear that one had died in kind of teenage years or young adulthood, which is just a little detail that we can put into our overall knowledge of David and not looked into it, but it may explain something of his character. And then another thing to note about, because you had these seven brothers uh, that passed by but weren't chosen, is that there didn't seem to be much wrong with them. There's nothing in this chapter, there's nothing negative stated about them. Uh, So we can say that they weren't rejected because they were bad, but just because David had the potential to be great. So if we carry on reading again. So none of these sons were chosen. And Samuel said unto Jesse, I hear all thy children. And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And we know from various other passages that David was uh, kind of a great shepherd. He really cared for his sheep. He put himself on the line for his sheep. And in this, um, we see a contrast with Saul, uh, which we saw back in chapter 9. Um, he was looking after the asses of Kish, Saul's father, uh, and they were lost. And Saul doesn't seem to have a clue where they were, and he wanders around a big, massive circuit. So there's a bit of a contrast at the start of their lives that Saul, it doesn't seem, was particularly good at looking after the asses, but David, by contrast, faithfully stayed with his sheep. Um, Then in Psalm 78, uh, we have a little passage about David and the sheep. Um, And starting at verse 70. This is one of the like long psalms, which is a history um, of Israel up until that time as a nation, um, and it ends talking about David. Um, so verse seventeen, talking about the Lord, He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes, great with young, He brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So from this we can see that some of the skills that David needed as king he learned when he was being shepherd. Um, So the little detail is in verse 71 from following the ewes great with young. Um, And when a ewe is pregnant she becomes really, really fat and if she falls over she can't get back up again and they normally die if that happens so if you're a shepherd a pregnant ewe is the most um, well one of the most vulnerable sheep so that's why that little detail is in there is saying that David looked after all the sheep but particularly he looked after the vulnerable ones as a good shepherd and therefore we Likewise, as kind of mini shepherds, should therefore look after the vulnerable ones amongst ourselves. Because he goes from looking after the vulnerable to feeding the whole people. So that's what we would do if we wish to be great, 
because we have to look after the vulnerable. So, return back to 1 Samuel 16 again. Um, uh, so Jesse sends for David, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. Um, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. In the second part of the chapter, we're going to look again at this description of David, because we see another description, more of a description of his character later in the chapter, so we're going to look at those two things together. Um, but an interesting thing to note throughout kind of Samuel and Kings is that kind of good looks ran in David's family. We won't turn them up, um, but Eliab, um, it seems he looked the part in verses 6 to 7, because as we saw, um, it looks as if he was the one. And verse 7, kind of the famous verse, doesn't make sense if Eliab wasn't a good-looking chap. So we can imagine that he was. And Absalom, of course, was famous for his flowing hair and everyone loved to crowd around him and all that stuff. And then in 1 Kings 1 as well, Adonijah also was good-looking. Um, so we have kind of a little bunch of good-looking people, but they act in quite different ways. So some were good, like David overall, it was a man after God's own heart. Absalom died in disgrace. And then, as we saw with Eliab, he was kind of a mixed character. But he was a good leader. So, from these people, um, although verse 7, the main point, obviously, is that it's not too important what you look like. Um, particularly in these times, like the times of the kings, it didn't matter to God what you look like, but it did matter to people what you look like which is why they chose Saul. Um, But those good looks, they could be a blessing to you because you could use whatever charm that has to get people to do good, like David generally did, or you could use it like Absalom did, um, basically for your own vanity and power. And so if you count yourself as good-looking, make sure you use it for good purposes. Um, So then verse 13... Uh, final verse we're going to look at tonight then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward so Samuel rose up and went to Ramah so just had a little think about the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward Um, it's still a very very long time until David becomes king so kind of many many years so it's just interesting I've not really come to any conclusions precisely what that means so if anyone has any thoughts afterwards about what that means in reality then uh, that would be interesting to hear um, and then another thing to think about because there was this long time forward is that it's not stated in the text or anything but it would seem probable that David would have kept up a relationship with Samuel and we'll see next week a little um, clue to think that that was probably true so he probably would have Samuel would either have come back to David or David may have gone up to see Samuel but we'll think a little bit more about that next week Um, we're just going to finish with a little slide about kind of working for God so if we go back to the start of the chapter um, Samuel was an instrument for God because he was sent to do something um, but because he was scared of Saul he didn't fancy it he kind of shrunk back from it how can I go if Saul hear it he will kill me but Samuel didn't just keep quiet and not bother kind of like Jonah did just run away he at least kind of replied to God and said uh, he explained he, that he was scared and why he was scared. Um, but God said again, no, you've got to go. So even though he was scared and explained to God, he went faithfully. Um, and he went, but even then, when he went, it wasn't necessarily 
to begin with a very nice task. Because if the theory we said earlier about Bethlehem was right, it wasn't. It would have been a very awkward place to go to. Um, so he's probably met with some, I don't know if distrust is the right word, but it wasn't a very nice task to go about originally. But again, he kept on going with it. So, um, so if we have a job that we know we need to do, because sometimes there's things that over a period of time we kind of realise that we should do, but sometimes for whatever reason um, we can be too scared to do it. We might think that we're not good enough to do that, or we might think that if we do that thing, even though it's right, other people might react badly. So if we do have that situation, then we've got to do what Samuel did, and explain it to God. But then we can explain it, but it might still be, be clear that we've still got to do it. So if we do that, we might do it, and we might meet opposition like we thought we were going to. But we've just got to do it anyway, and then a good thing will come out of it, because if you do a good thing, eventually you will be rewarded. And Samuel was lucky because he was rewarded quite quickly in having the happiness of anointing David. Um... So yeah, that's all I'm going to say tonight. Um, I didn't go into anointing much because I thought I'd have a look at some little other things. Um, But we'll come back next time and think some more about David's character.